God bless you, everyone. My name is David Ewan, and I represent Braveheart and Academy, which is uh, part of the Boston Institute. It's an institute with Christian values. And uh, later this week, I'll be attending the church uh, talking about something called First Fruits. And um, what I'm about to present here in Europe is what I'll be presenting here in the United States. Um, and what we're going to be talking about is uh, tithes, offerings, and first fruits. If I talk about first fruits then by itself, then it would be a little confusing. So what I'm going to do is talk about tithes and offerings uh, first, and then that'll make sense as to what first fruits is all about. So the only way you can be ready for first fruits is if you know what fruit first fruits is. If I don't tell you about tithes and offerings first, then the first fruits won't make any sense. So that's what I'm going to do. We'll talk about tithes and offerings first, and next we'll talk about first fruits. Finally, you'll be an expert in all three. That's the idea. Today we'll discuss the theology of first fruits, that is, the academic understanding of first fruits. Next week, what we'll do is we'll talk about the divinity of first fruits, that's the spiritual understanding of first fruits. So let me tell you a story before we begin. Here's a story of when I was a small boy with one of my brothers. I'm from a large family, so I'm talking about my younger brother. My brother and I are in a sandbox with our toy dump trucks. He had a blue one and I had a red one. Both were the same other than the color. We could exchange, but he kept blue and I kept red. What is mine is mine and what is his is his. But the question is, who owned the trucks and where did they come from? We just assumed that those toy dump trucks was our kingdom and it's something that we owned. Well, I'll tell you what it was. It was a Christmas gift given out of love from our parents. So our parents really owned those toy dump trucks. On Christmas day, my mother was sitting next to me. I remember I was sitting and she was kneeling next to me and I said, where's my truck? And she said, here it is. And she put her hand on it. Here's the funny thing. And this is a true story. I didn't know why I said it. I don't even know that I, I didn't know at the time that I was getting a toy dump truck uh, for Christmas. It was assumed for me, the truck was mine. It didn't matter who it was, who it was for, or where it came from. See, this is a story of what we do in our daily lives. We convert love into assumed ownership. See, my parents gave me this toy dump truck out of love, but as a young child, as a baby in this world, I just had the assumed ownership. It was a selfish conditioning of the mind that's developed when we are young. Uh, it's natural as it's part of our self-defense. It's part of our survival mechanism. The root source of this mechanism is good as humankind for survival. So it's, it's, it's good to have that. See, God gives us love by blessings, and we assume we own it through our selfish desires. So here's another illustration. I do two things at Harvard University here in the United States. First, my team and I are creating a state holiday working with the governor of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's something we're doing at Harvard University. That's a story and a testimony that I'll share with you next year. Second, I'm taking a course of study in theology for divinity at Harvard University. I graduate sometime in December. Uh, that's a fun secret, I haven't told anyone. The old me would have said, I worked hard and I paid for it and my hard work positioned me to work with the governor's office and Harvard University. Very prideful attitude. That's my old way. That's not how I am now. The new way recognizes that God gave me an opportunity, that this is the new me. God gave me an opportunity for even greater blessings in the future. I owe God gratitude for opportunity. God gave me opportunity, and I owe God that. So I owe uh, God gratitude. So how do I pay for it? It's done through character and integrity. Say to yourself, character and integrity. The Bible teaches us biblical principles related to character and integrity. Again, character and integrity. Character relates to an offering that you give from your heart. 
That's the behavior towards giving. Integrity relates to tithing. That's the obedience to instruction. We're going to talk more about that. More will be explained soon. Tithes and offerings are different. They're not the same. You see, at this point now, I'm not talking about first fruits. There is an order, and that we'll talk about later. So number one, tithes is number one. It's given first. Number two, offerings is number two. It's given after. So for you to be able to give an offering, it's after you've already given the tithes. So tithes is number one and offerings is second. So let's start simple. Let's begin with tithes. A tithe is a specific amount. It's 10%. It's something that's measured. It's what you give first and an offering is anything extra that you give beyond the 10%. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, the scripture reads, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. What we're talking about the fields produce each year is that that's the income. See, thousands of years ago, it was an agricultural society. In modern times, it's a financial society. So this is a biblical principle that is different from an offering. Tithing is the first 10%, and an offering is what is after and beyond the 10%. It's not the same. An offering alone is not a biblical principle because an offering is what comes after tithes. Without tithes, there is no offering, okay? So imagine a broken down car with a tow truck, right? The car is dead without a tow truck. It goes nowhere, okay? You need the tow truck to have the car. An offering in terms of biblical principle is dead without the tithe. An offering alone is ignorance. It's that simple. Because an offering has the understanding that a tithe is first. Now, the payment of the tithe is an obligation. What does it mean by an obligation? An instruction was given for procedures to be followed. So let me read. Uh, we read in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. Again, that's Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, where Christians are required to give 10% of their income to God through the church. If faithfully adhered to, the act is to attract rich blessings from the Lord. This is also confirmed in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. So a lesson on tithes can be found in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. It's also in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. So see, now you have a guide. We'll talk about Malachi later. So tithing is a form of obedience because it shows God you trust him not money to provide. You trust God to provide. You don't trust money to provide. Again, tithing is an act of obedience. Worship, on the other hand, is ministry unto the Lord. I'm going to say that again. Worship is ministry unto the Lord. You cannot minister to the Lord with your money. He doesn't need it. What the Lord needs is your obedience. See, tithing ensures that our needs will be met and gives back to God that was always his. God honored, God is honored when we're faithful. Now, as I said before, is that tithing ensures that our needs will be met and gives back to God what, he, what already was his. It's like those toy dump trucks I told you about. It was my parents that bought them. So technically it was theirs, okay? So now let's talk about disobedience. Why not? It's what people do. No surprise there. So this will help us understand a little bit more about tithing and offering. If you don't pay tithes, the Bible says you are robbing God and you are under a curse. Did you hear me say the word curse? Okay, I'll say it again. If you don't pay tithes, the Bible says you're robbing God and you are under a curse. This curse cannot be removed by your good works or the fact that you are born again. It cannot. And I'm going to explain that. You can only reverse this curse if you start paying the tithes. The tithes is the only key to prosperity and God's blessing. The book of Malachi teaches us that. Okay, so I'm going to read Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. 
Okay, so here's the scripture. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me, but you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me on this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now let's talk about what an offering is. And an offering is best described in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. I just finished reading about tithes, um, and that's in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. Um, but uh, now I'm going to talk about an offering. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. And the scripture says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart, in your heart, uh, to give and not reluctantly under compulsion, for God loves a chill, cheerful giver. So as I said before, tithing is the first 10%, and an offering is what is after and beyond that 10%. They're not the same. Remember, we talked about Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. So De Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, that talks about tithes. And 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, that talks about offering. Okay. And remember, we learned that tithes is explained more in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, and Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. Okay, now I'm going to talk about character integrity and pull all of, all of this together. A tithe is a specific amount. It's 10% of your income that you give first. An offering is anything extra that you give beyond that. Character comes from your offering. It's what's in your heart. Integrity comes from your tithing. You are entrusted with the principles in the Bible to follow. It's what determines your trustworthiness. So here's a review of tithing and offering. Character relates to the offering. Integrity relates to the tithing. So an offering reflects your character. Obedience to tithing shows your true integrity. Character can be best defined in 2 Corinthians verse, chapter 9, verse 7, and that's an offering. And integrity can be learned about in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, and that's the tithe. And becoming a tithing expert, you look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, and Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. Now, Let's talk about charitable donations in the United States, okay? And this may also occur to other nations as well. So charitable donations are tax deductible and the IRS considers church tithing tax deductible as well. To deduct the amount you tithe to your church or place of worship, report the amount you donate to qualified charitable organizations such as the church uh, on Schedule A, and that's schedule, that's a form, that's a document that's here in the United States, okay, and that's called itemized deductions. Now, usually at a church, cash is best put in an envelope, and with your cell phone, take a picture of the envelope. Um, if you're writing out a check, that check is your receipt, um, and if you're paying by card, um, usually the receipt is either emailed or text to you. Um, okay, so now we know about tithing and offerings. Now we can talk about first fruits. Okay, we're ready now. Now we can talk about first fruits. So what is first fruits in the Bible? So here's how the history goes. The book of Exodus narrates how Moses led the Israelites in the building, the tabernacle. Okay, and that's in Exodus chapter uh, in Exodus 35 through 40, and with God's instructions, and that's in Exodus 25 through 31. Then in the book of Leviticus, God tells the Israelites and their priests how to make offerings in the tabernacle and how to conduct themselves while camped around the holy tent sanctuary. The book of Exodus talks about the people 
the book of Leviticus talks about the instructions. Let's talk about that again. The book of Exodus talks about the people. The book of Leviticus talks about the instructions. The book of Leviticus is the third book of the Torah and of the Old Testament in the Bible. It contains a record of God's installing a priesthood for his nation and giving them a biblical set of principles that would enable them to maintain holiness in his eyes. Now, I'm going to be reading Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. And uh, we'll talk about the definition of a sheaf because that's in the scripture. A sheaf is a bundle of grain stalks laid lengthwise and tied together after reaping. Okay, so it's, uh, it's a grain that is tied together. So it's the grain stalks. So in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10, when you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priest. And that's in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. So did you hear me say first fruits? So the concepts of first fruit is rooted in biblical times when people lived in an agricultural society. Harvest time was significant because that was when the hard work the farmers had poured into their crops all year began to pay off. They were literally reaping what they sowed. That's the phrase that you hear about, reap what you sow. So God called his people to bring the first yield, the first early portion of the harvest, the first fruits. This was demonstrated uh, that the Israelites, that they had obedience and trust and reverence to God. Back then, there were plenty of rules associated with making first fruit sacrifices. They had to be brought to the temple priests. Know that their crops could be harvested until after the first fruits were presented. I'm going to say that again. That's why it's called first fruits. No other crops could be harvested until after the first fruits were presented. So the first fruits was the best of the selection because it, it wasn't the last scraps left over. It was a, comple a very complex process. That is why it has become ceremonial. So the, the delivery or the bringing of the first fruits to your priest or to your pastor or a church leader is ceremonial because it's not a routine. It's not something that happens every week, okay? So the Hebrew word for first fruit is bikurim. That's it, bikurim. It literally translated to promise to come. Doesn't that sound a little prophetic, promise to come? The Israelites saw these first fruits as an investment an investment into the future. God told them that if they brought their first fruits to him, he would bless all that came afterwards. So that's why they brought the first fruits from their harvest, because if they did that out of obedience, then they knew God would have favor and provision on the rest of the harvest. So first fruits is a prophetic offering. Now, Let's remember what we talked about before. Tithes relates to integrity. That's the trust and obedience. An offering relates to character. That's the behavior. Now you know first fruits is a prophetic offering. That's how the three are different. Now let's talk about first fruits in the Bible. Honor, and you hear about it in Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 9. I was about to read it. It's Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. We see the term first fruits initially mentioned in the book of Exodus, when Moses is leading God's people out of captivity in Egypt. God instructed the Israelites to give up the first of their crops so that they could understand the value of God's blessings. Through the first five books of the Bible, Moses brings up the idea uh, of a total of 15, uh, 13, I should say, 13 times. That's because it was an essential concept for his people to understand. You see, first fruits is mentioned throughout the Old Testament, and it's even referenced in the New Testament as well. In the New Testament, the term first fruit takes on a symbolic meaning. The Apostle Paul wrote to demand higher ethical and moral standards. He also used a metaphor for first fruits. He was writing to the church of Corinth. You've heard about the book of Corinthians, first and second of uh, Corinthians. Uh, that's an ancient city in Greece. 
It's in the south central part of Greece. The remains of an ancient city lie about 50 miles or 80 kilometers west of Athens, Athens, Greece. So let me tell you about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 through 22. So, and the scripture reads, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So Christ was our first fruit. See, Jesus was God's first fruits, his one and only son, and the best that humanity had to offer. God gave Jesus, who was raised from the dead, up for us in the same way that we sacrifice the best we have for God. We no longer live in an agricultural-based society. You likely don't worry about harvest time or giving away the first yield of your crops. But the idea of first fruits is still relevant. It just takes on a new meaning for us because we live in a, a money world, a financial world. Our first fruits has moved from an agricultural to a modern day harvest, the financial harvest. Today, you sow the seeds to reap a financial harvest in your bank account. So your farm fields is your bank account. That is the farm that you manage. Now, I'm going to take a moment and talk about the difference between first fruits and tithings. Ezekiel's ministry, you've heard about the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's ministry was conducted in Jerusalem and Babylon in the first three decades of the sixth century. He held that each man was responsible for his own acts. As a prophet, he focused on the responsibility as it relates to the future. Be responsible for your acts today and that will determine your future. Okay, that was the major message from Ezekiel. Before the first surrender of Jerusalem, he was a functioning priest and prophet. We're talking about Ezekiel. He was among those deported to Babylonia. The town of Babylon was located along the Euphrates River in present-day Iraq. That, that's where it is. I always have to check that to see where the stories of where in the map it is in the Middle East. So I'm going to read Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30. In the scripture reads, the first of all first fruits of every kind and every contribution of every kind from all your contribution shall be for the priest. You shall also give to the priest the first of your dough to cause a blessing to rest on your house. And that's Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30. First offerings are typically an annual gift to the church done at harvest time. Because we're not actually harvesting crops, the harvest can mean different things to different people. Perhaps you just got a bonus at work. Maybe you just received a huge uh, tax refund check. Maybe you uh, got a good deal on a contract. Um, and for our American partners, maybe you save 15% or more on car insurance by switching to GEICO. That's an inside joke here in the United States. Um, so these are all harvest time moments. That's what we're talking about. Uh, these are harvest time moments when your hard work paid off. These are also great opportunities to turn back to God in gratitude for the blessings. You see, whenever you decide to make a first fruit offering, the important thing is that you do it freely with no guilt or obligation, okay? This is supposed to be a celebration of all that God has done for you. It's a kind of worship that you can use to support the work of others. A first fruit offering is our opportunity to give and beyond the regular tithe. Making our first fruit offering opens us up to allow God to work in our life. When we approach God with open hands rather than clenched fists, it makes it easier for him, <coughs> excuse me, it makes it easier for him to give us more to work with. Giving of our first fruits reminds us that God is our ultimate priority. It's not the money. It shows God that we are obedient to him and that we can be trusted with more. Perhaps the most important thing about this is being generous in this way shows us that we are grateful for all that God has given us. See, first fruits are an offering to God of the increase in income that we receive. Notice we're talking about the increase in income not the overall amount. Specifically, first fruits is the first portion 
of that increase. See, the fruits are your blessings from God. That is your harvest. First fruits is the first portion of that harvest. What you give to God acknowledges that what you have is from God. That is why we give our first fruits. So the motivation of first fruits is a free will offering that we offer out of generosity. It shows that we are not in love with money and we are grateful to God as the ultimate source of the increase. See, offering first fruits when we receive an increase is a demonstration of our faith in God as the true source of our provision. Remember, when we consider what faith is, we need to acknowledge that faith is an action word. James said that unless faith produces action, it really isn't faith at all. And I'll read in James chapter 2, verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So faith by itself is dead if it is not accompanied by action. The first fruits offering is one way to activate our faith in God as our provider. Okay, let's talk about how first fruits giving is an expression of gratitude, dedication, and trust. <clears throat> Again, it's gratitude, dedication, and trust. In, as it relates to gratitude, and again, we're talking about first fruits, it's acknowledging that everything comes from God. So we have gratitude that everything comes from God. Number two, the dedication. That's de declaring this and everything that follows belongs to God. Okay, this and everything that follows. That means your first fruits and everything remaining is also uh, belonging to God. <clears throat> Trust, the last one, number three, it's expressing faith in God's continued provision. So you believe that not only are you uh, giving gratitude, but you also have the dedication and you also have the trust uh, in the provision. So now let's talk about how to give a first fruits offering. In Romans chapter 11, verse 16, the scripture reads, if the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And that is Romans 11, 16, chapter 11, verse 16 in Romans. So what does this practically look like? How do you determine how, when, and how much you should give as the first fruits offering? This is going to look a different for every person in every season. The process of giving above your normal tithe can help prepare you for God uh, to make a difference in your life. Making a first fruit offering demonstrates obedience to God rather than obedience to money. Do you want to follow God or do you want to follow money? See, first fruits uh, are a tangible offering. It's a concept that is honorable and holy to God. By offering the first portion of our increase to God as first fruits offering, we move the entire increase out of the world's curse system and into the kingdom of God for as long as it continues in the spiritual realm. Once we make a portion of the increase holy by offering it to God, we have in fact made the entire increase holy. Okay, here's God's promise for first fruits. Let's talk about God's promise for first fruits. Not only does the first fruits offering move the entire increase that we received into the blessing, <coughs> pardon me, uh, into the blessings of the kingdom of God and out of the world's curse system, but it also comes with an important promise. And we find that in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And that's in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. Obviously, that promise was written in an agricultural society. I don't know about you, but I don't have any barns or wine presses to overflow with new wine. So what does this verse mean? What does it mean to us today? Well, centuries ago, barns were the storage areas for people to save up provision. For most of us today, the place where we store up provision is in our bank accounts. So that means the first fruits offerings will help ensure our bank accounts are always filled with plenty of provision. When you think about it, those promises make sense. Our first fruit offerings demonstrate that we can be trusted with money because we don't love it. 
Proverbs says that we are honoring God with our first fruits. Therefore, since we can be trusted to be good stewards over our finances, God can keep income flowing to us knowing it will be handled responsibly. Today we talked about theology. That's the academic understanding of first fruits. Next week we'll talk about divinity. That will be the spiritual understanding of first fruits. Um, we learned about tithings and offerings and how it relates to character and integrity. Once we got that out of the way, we talked about the first fruits by giving history to it and apply the meaning with today's understanding. So that is uh, a little discussion of first fruits. I thank you for joining me. My name is David Ewan, and this is EPN News.